Hi, I'm Dr. Joshua Beckman, and I am the chair of the PVD Council uh, of the AHA. I'm speaking to you from the ATVB PVD FGTB annual scientific sessions. Today it's my pleasure to talk to you uh, with Dr. Garrett Fitzgerald. He's our distinguished lecturer and has given a wonderful lecture on molecular clocks and cardiometabolic disease. Dr. Fitzgerald, can you tell us what a molecular clock is and how it relates to metabolic disease? So molecular clocks are present in almost all of our tissues, not present in the testis for some reason that has yet to be discerned. Uh, but there is a central clock in the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain. Uh, and peripheral clocks can be entrained by the central clock to maintain a 24-hour rhythm. It's an interesting connection. It's a little like an orchestra. Uh, the peripheral clocks have the capacity to follow the instructions from the center, but also have the potential for autonomy. Uh, and furthermore, we've found that peripheral clocks can send signals back to the brain to entrain central function. So it's very much like uh, uh, a concert master in an orchestra where everyone has the capacity to play on their own. Generally, they follow the concert master's orders, uh, but their, their, their way of playing can influence the way the concert master uh, performs his duty as well. And so what's the link to cardiometabolic disease? So uh, clockworks are a very interesting uh, biological network. Uh, they play an important role in knitting together biological networks across organisms. And therefore, when they break down, we get the uh, display of metabolic dysfunction, uh, as in the metabolic syndrome. Uh, we get. Um, disordered response in terms of immunoregulation, so we get inflammation. And uh, disordered clockworks have been implicated also in aging. Is it possible that there is a centrally dysfunctioning clock that then drives others, or is it usually a pattern of clock disturbance that causes disease? So we know from, in terms of that question, most of what we know actually derives from work in mice, uh, where we and other people have disabled the one uh, non-redundant uh, core clock gene, BMAL1, in multiple tissues by now. And we know that uh, uh, disabling it in, in the center uh, disorders all circadian rhythms, but you can knock it out selectively in vascular smooth muscle cells, in endothelial cells, in adipocytes, in the liver, uh, and get an array of different uh, expressions of elements of the metabolic syndrome. Okay. And have this, has this work moved into the human investigational yes. realm yet? Yes. We're, we're very excited particularly about that. So most of what we know in humans so far derives from what are called forced desynchrony protocols, uh, where people are studied under very controlled circumstances, uh, the amount of time they have available to sleep, uh, is regulated and disordered. And these forced desynchrony protocols allow us to segregate endogenous rhythms driven by the uh, molecular clock and rhythms driven by environmental cues, most of which we don't understand. We've been uh, very informed by that type of work, but we've also been interested to see if we can discern circadian rhythms in humans in the wild. In other words, is there a sufficient signal for us to be able to detect uh, circadian patterns against the noise of the diversity of human behavior. And we've recently completed a pilot study in a small number of individuals uh, where, to our surprise, we've been heartened by the fact that we can see uh, diurnal oscillation in the microbiome, for example, in elements of the metabolome and proteome, as well as the genome. Uh, and we've integrated that with multiple approaches to remote sensing. Uh, so we're encouraged to uh, project this study onto scale uh, and to look with sufficient power to characterize what we call the physiological chronobiome. And it's important to do that because we need that information before we can start looking in an unbiased way uh, for mechanistic information that might explain the time-dependent expression of disease. And we know that, for example, diseases like asthma, myocardial infarction, stroke, depression, uh, they all oscillate. Even aches and pains in your joint due to the cartilage clock, 
they all oscillate as a, as a function of time of day in terms of their expression. And what we have very little understanding of is the mechanistic explanation of that. That's a pretty incredible journey, journey from the bench to the bedside. Mm -hmm. I think the lecture was absolutely spe uh, spectacular, and hopefully you'll get to look at it online at another time. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Josh.